Head of Product at Discovery Employee Benefits. It's a pleasure for me to share uh, some of our thoughts on a behavioral approach to retirement funds, something that we think the industry uh, is desperately in need of. Firstly, I want to start with some uh, thoughts about why we're doing what we're doing. Why should we save for retirement? And I think there are perhaps two, uh, two good reasons. The first, if you think about it just logically, is that there's a period of our lives where our parents support us. There's a period of our lives where our income supports us. And then there's a period belong, beyond that where our savings support us. And that is a long period of time where there will be no income and no support. And so purely logically, everyone will agree that it's a good idea to have a big chunk of savings to support you through that period where no one else is going to do it. And then mathematically, why is it a good idea to do this? Well, mathematically, it makes an enormous amount of sense to save for retirement, especially in retirement vehicles. Um, an example given here is if you save 5,000 a month uh, for 20 years and uh, one person saves outside of a retirement vehicle, uh, they'll end up with about 3.4 million rand and another person saves inside a retirement vehicle, they'll end up with 4.4 uh, million rand, almost a third extra uh, simply because they are in a tax efficient vehicle. And so that uh, uh, ability to access something so incredibly tax efficient is of huge favorable impact on individuals and a great reason to save for retirement in retirement vehicles. Why don't we save for retirement though? If we all can think logically, mathematically that it makes a lot of sense, why do people not do it? Well, there uh, again, I'll just give two of the best reasons. There are, there are actually many. Uh, the first is perhaps a present bias, which is our tendency to give a much stronger weight to payoffs that are close to us in time uh, uh, than to ones that are far off into the future. And of course, retirement is very far in the future for many. Um, uh, certainly, it's a long time in the future for those uh, who should be starting to save now and, and doing the right things. Um, and so it makes it really hard to prioritize this very intangible uh, priority in people's lives. The second one is an exponential growth bias. And this is essentially the fact that people find it very hard to understand exponential growth. They find it hard to really appreciate how much work compound interest will do for them. Um, and so their expectation of what will happen in the future is linear, uh, even when what will actually happen in the future is exponential. So we underestimate the benefit of this extra compound growth that we're going to get. And as I mentioned earlier, the tax-free compound growth that we're going to get. In order to address these challenges, uh, there are a number of behavioral biases that I want to introduce you to. Perhaps you've heard of some of them before, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to relate to many of them. Um, and then I'll speak about how we can put those uh, behaviors to work for us. So these are behaviors that are at work in our lives every single day. So to illustrate the first one, I'd like to ask you how you would feel if you lost 50,000 Rand. And how would you feel if you won 50,000 Rand? And are those different? Would you feel differently if you lost 50,000 Rand versus if you won 50,000 Rand? Well, the, the answer from studies, uh, many studies into this well um, documented behavioral bias is that people perceive the value of a loss much more greatly than they perceive the value of a gain. And another way to put that is that losses are feared more than gains are appreciated. Um, and that's a powerful behavioral bias uh, that it's important for us to be aware of. And I'll show you a bit later how we can put that to work. The second one uh, is illustrated by this question. Would you save 1% extra of your salary today, right now, today? So your next month's paycheck uh, is going to give you 1% less. Or would you do that a year from now? If you decide at your next year's um, salary increase, that you'll increase your contribution to savings by 1%. And here, the well-documented effect is that there's something called future bias. That means that people make much better decisions when the action that needs to be taken is in the future. Um, and so, whereas today you might find it really hard to do the right thing, it's relatively easy for you to actually coolly, calmly know what the right thing is and make a decision about it as long as you don't have to affect it today. Looking at another behavioral bias, here's a question. 
if you find out that another cell phone network's costs are 10% cheaper, would you switch providers today? Or would you stay with your current provider and be honest on this one? Uh, what happens for most people is that we can't tend to keep doing exactly what we're doing. It takes quite a lot of force to move us out of the path we are currently in. And this is called our behavioral inertia. And you may recognize this in many areas of your life. Um, uh, it's uh, quite closely correlated uh, to the idea of procrastination, that it takes a lot for people to move out of the path that they are currently in. And that can be a very hard behavioral bias to work against, uh, but you'll see a bit later how it can be utilized to work for people. And now another one, would you buy a small Coke for 10 Rand or a large Coke for 12 Rand? Would you buy a small Coke for 10 Rand or a large Coke for 12 Rand? What I did with that question there actually was employ what's called a decoy effect. Uh, and what this says is that a preference for an option changes in the presence of another inferior option. So the 10 Rand for a small Coke was the inferior option. It's almost the same price as the large Coke, but I've signaled that it's small, it's inferior. Uh, and so the large Coke seems more attractive than the small Coke. If I'd simply asked you, would you buy a large Coke for 12 Rand? Your answer may be no or yes. But when I ask you in the presence of the inferior option of a small Coke of 10 Rand, uh, your likelihood of choosing the preferred option of buying a large Coke for 12 Rand is increased. And that's called that's called the decoy effect, another well-documented behavioral bias. So that's a whirlwind tour through some of the behavioral biases that are very well documented and that we can employ. And what I want to show you now is how these behavioral biases can work for us, can work on our behalf through cleverly uh, designed interfaces, uh, programs, incentives, etc. The first one is to uh, describe to you what we've done in the Discovery Retirement Funds to, um, to benefit from some of these behavioral biases in our boost model. So uh, let's just think for a second about a theoretical journey to retirement. The theoretical journey to retirement, if someone starts from today, they've been saving for some time, so they have an asset built up. They've got that asset, they're gonna make further contributions and they'll get to a final fund at some point and they'll uh, get the benefit of compound growth over that journey. What happens in practice, of course, is that most people end up with a break in that journey. Um, and so what they get to retirement is totally different from what they would have if they continued on that theoretical retirement journey. Now, what contributes to most people, really, by far the majority of people, having at least one break in their retirement journey? One of the thing that, things that contribute to that is that there is no loss at the break point. At the point that you decide to take your retirement savings in cash, it is a pure gain scenario. You are going to get a bigger lump sum of cash out than you've ever got out before. You set your eyes on it, your eyes start watering, and uh, you can think of all the really good, uh, even responsible things you could do with that money, um, and so you end up end up doing it. What we do by introducing boosts is that firstly, it adds real money to someone's outcomes. Um, and that money is afforded by the fact that if the person were not going to stay to retirement, uh, we would earn much less fees on that person through their lifetime. So we can present value the extra fees that we would earn and give that to an individual at, as boosts along the way in their journey. So that's all shared value funded. It's funded by the person's actual behavior of staying invested to retirement. So we add those boosts in. What that means at the potential break point is that we then um, utilize the behavioral bias of loss aversion. Instead of having a pure gain scenario, you have a gain, cash out, and a loss. A potential boost amount, which could be anything, for argument's sake, 200,000 rand, a big amount of money that you are gonna lose if you take this cash out. And so in many cases, people will still make that choice. These things are not binary, but it certainly sways the probabilities uh, in favor of people doing the right thing. There'll be many people who, because of uh, that boost being in place, that loss being presented to them at the point of decision, 
will decide to leave their money in cash, knowing for many other good reasons that it's the right thing to do. The second uh, 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 intervention that we've designed utilizing a number of behavioral biases that I introduced earlier is our contribution optimizer. So to illustrate that, I've shown in a very simple way um, what a, a sort of normal journey to retirement looks like. A person's salary increases over their lifetime. The percentage of that salary that they contribute to retirement stays constant. And so their net income increases every year. If they continue on this path, their net replacement ratio, let's say for argument's sake, is 50%. Uh, what we would propose would close the gap for someone is to make small incremental increases in that contribution over time as their salary goes up so that their net salary still increases, but increases at a slightly lower rate. And it happens slowly over time. And amazingly, that will actually get them to a replacement ratio of 75% or whatever it is they're targeting. Uh, one could find the solution that solves for that problem. So how are we using behavioral science in this? The first is accessing this behavioral bias of future bias. So the fact that people make good decisions about their future selves. Uh, so here by offering someone today to make a decision about what will happen when their salary goes up next year, if you've adequately convinced someone that increasing their contributions is a really good thing that they want to do, um, and you offer them the opportunity to do that at the next salary increase date and salary increase dates beyond that, uh, they are quite likely actually to accept that um, option. The second is a decoy effect. What we do in the Discovery Retirement Fund is when we offer that opportunity, we offer two options. Instead of making it a choice between should I do this or should I not do this, we make it a choice between should I do this at 2% over a long period of time or at 4% over a shorter period of time, or 1% and 2%, whatever the specific percentages are that solve for that individual's retirement savings gap. And so there we find more people taking a decision uh, because we've employed uh, the decoy effect in that. And then finally, the most powerful one perhaps in this space is behavioral inertia. Because a person makes a decision now about behaviors that will be implemented next year, the year after that and the year after that until they've reached the correct retirement savings level, uh, they need not engage again ever. And because of inertia, their chances of going in and changing that trajectory is low. And so that's what enables one to affect today a set of increases that will implement over the future, get someone to their retirement savings goal uh, and ultimately uh, get them to where they want to be, where they need to be by utilizing these behaviors in their favor rather than against them. And so we've implemented that uh, in the Discovery Retirement Funds. I'm just giving you here a short uh, replay of what that visually looks like, showing someone what their projected income is, what the gap is, giving them a personalized goal that will close their gap. And as they select that goal, the visual feedback that they are now on track for retirement, which incidentally again employs loss aversion and something called an anchoring bias, um, so that that person now knows they're on track for a funded retirement and they're even less likely to alter that trajectory because they like the idea. It's emotionally gratifying to know that they are on track for a funded retirement, something they perhaps thought they never would be. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. I hope it's been insightful. Um, I hope you've learned something or at the very least uh, found it entertaining and interesting. Um, and, uh, and we really hope that more in the retirement savings industry will employ these biases, these tools in the service of what is a social need in our country and truly across the world of doing all we can to help people to sh shift their retirement savings trajectories so that they have dignified retirement outcomes. Thank you very much for listening. I look forward to engaging with you.